Welcome everybody to College of Science Virtual Seminar, our second one for spring 2021. Um, I'm Michael Kaufman, the Dean of the College of Science, and very happy that you are all able to join us here today. Um, a couple of uh, introductory notes. Um, once the speaker gets started, um, you can feel free to put your um, comments and questions in the chat. Um, if I see something that looks like it's uh, important to interrupt the speaker with, I will do that at the moment. And if it looks like it's a more general question, um, I'll let you ask, ask your own question uh, as we get uh, to the end of the talk. Um, today's speaker is uh, Laura Miller Conrad, an associate professor um, in the Department of Chemistry at San Jose State University, um, who is a chemical biologist, organic chemist, and biochemist, I guess all of the above, depending on uh, what work she happens to be doing. Um, I like the blurry lines, it's really cool. Um, just uh, a little bit of Laura's background. Laura um, got her BA in chemistry with a biochemistry emphasis at McAllister College. Um, then her PhD in organic chemistry um, out here at UC Berkeley then uh, ducked back to the East Coast uh, for a postdoc at Princeton for four years. And then uh, after she finished her postdoc at Princeton, she uh, came here to join us at San Jose State University where she has been now for, is it, I guess it's- uh, Since 2014. Year now? So it's been yeah. a while. So yeah. Um, and uh, today she is gonna tell us about her work um, Helping Old Drugs Beat Bad Bugs, Serendipitous Discovery of an Antibiotic Adjuvant. And I actually had to look up the word adjuvant, and I'm sure she's going to tell us more about it in the talk today. Um, but uh, this is work uh, on which Laura is involved in some patentable uh, research as well. Um, she and her collaborators have a patent um, pending uh, or under in review uh, for the work she's going to describe today. So i um, very excited to hear what she has to tell us. So Laura, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Thanks uh, for everyone who has been able to come on this very busy week of the first week of the semester. So I appreciate you taking some time to hear about some of our work we've done that led to the discovery of an antibiotic adjuvant. So an adjuvant is a small molecule in this case that helps the antibiotic work better. Um, you might have heard adjuvants in the case of vaccines as well, so that they stimulate the immune response to help um, the vaccines work better. In this case, the adjuvant is helping the antibiotic work better so that a lower dose is required. But first, a little bit about the um, bad bugs that we're interested in treating. Um, so we're particularly interested in, in um, Pseudomonas rigenosa and other gram-negative bacteria. So um, Pseudomonas is a soil bacterium, but it is found basically everywhere. However, it's only generally problematic as an opportunistic pathogen for patients um, with weakened immune systems, for example, those who are critically ill in the hospital, those with implanted medical devices, for example, those who um, have a catheter or are on a ventilator, and those with chronic lung disease. You can see that um, that list um, overlaps quite nicely with patients who are critically ill with COVID-19 in the hospital. And indeed, Pseudomonas is a leading cause of secondary infections in those patients. The World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control have both identified multidrug resistant strains of Pseudomonas originosa as serious threats. Um, and they're a looming threat because there are few effective treatments available. And those few effective treatments that we do have are being um, rapidly diminished due to the rise of antibiotic resistance. So anytime there is an increase in the use of antibiotics, um, this, the rise of antibiotic resistance strains is accelerated. So the pandemic is really exacerbating the situation. So for all of these reasons, we think that it's really important to work on to develop new treatment strategies for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So rather than looking at traditional antibiotics that kill the bacterium or stop growth, 
um, we wanted to look at new strategies. So those traditional antibiotics put tremendous selective pressure on the bacteria to develop resistance. Um, instead, we wanted to look at an antivirulence approach that would not affect growth, but would rather inhibit virulence factors. So the bad things that bacteria export during an infection. The idea is that then these now more benign bacteria are more easily cleared by the immune system. So virulence is something that's not always turned on by bacteria. It's pretty um, energetically expensive. So bacteria use quorum sensing to figure out when they should turn that on, among other things. So quorum sensing is a cell-to-cell -cell communication strategy um, that bacteria use to time group behaviors. They're only going to be advantageous when done in concert. So um, this is enabled by the production and detection of a small molecule signal that allows the bacteria to be essentially able to count how many other bacteria are around and know it's time to, for example, mount an infection. So if we look at these two gray oblongs and imagine their cells, um, we can see that they are producing and exporting a small molecule signal, but that signal is at pretty low concentration when the population is low. However, as the population increases, the concentration of that signal is also going to increase until it can engage that signaling pathway, leading to the production of virulence factors, which I've cartooned as this green glow. So our idea is that if we interrupt this pathway or the production of a particular virulence factor, bacteria won't know it's time to turn those on. Again, keeping it in the benign state so the immune system can deal with it more easily on its own. And I chose this uh, green low specifically because the particular virulence factor of interest I'm going to talk to you about today um, is pyocyanin and other phenazines, particularly phenazine one carboxylic acid PCA. But pyocyanin is um, the small molecule that gives pseudomonas cultures their characteristic blue-green color. So phenazines like pyocyanin and PCA are redox active. So that's bad for the host. It causes oxidative stress. It leads to ATP depletion. It also interrupts the immune response. However, their redox active nature is important for their function in pseudomonas where they help the bacteria survive under low oxygen conditions. So during my postdoc, um, I developed along with um, Zenon, a undergraduate student who was working with me, a number of small molecule inhibitors of pyocyanin production. So on the left, we can see cuvettes of the cell-free supernatant of Pseudomonas ruginosa. So these small molecules are exported into the medium and we got rid of the cells and just have this cell-free medium. On the left, these are from wild type cells that were treated with DMSO, our negative control. So DMSO is the solvent we dissolve our small molecule drugs in. And we can see by our eyes that they're very green. Um, there's lots of pyocyanin being produced, um, which we can quantitate by UV viz. On the right, we see samples that were treated with 100 mil micromolar of our small molecule. And we can see that now those are not green. Um, they're just the pale yellow of the background color of the Luria Brittany broth medium that we grow the um, bacteria in. So we were really excited about this potential of this compound to inhibit phenazines, but we didn't know how it worked. Um, so we wanted to figure that out next. So if we're going to think about how to frame how these small molecules might work for their mechanism of action, we can think about the um, central dogma of biology. So the idea that DNA is transcribed to RNA and RNA is translated to proteins. So in many cells, including Pseudomonas, um, transcription is a major way to control a variety of things. Um, and indeed, quorum sensing um, regulates phenazine production at the transcriptional level. level. So to see if that's what was happening, we looked at mRNA levels, um, both on samples that were treated with our inhibitor and those that weren't. But we didn't see a major difference between um, the biosynthetic enzymes um, encoded, or the mRNA levels to encode the biosynthetic enzymes under those conditions. 
So it didn't seem to be affecting transcriptional level, levels of those biosynthetic genes. In addition, we looked at the transcription mRNA patterns, and they also were not consistent with inhibiting any of the known quorum sensing pathways of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it seemed that it wasn't a transcriptional control. So that leaves post-transcriptional regulation. So anything after mRNA is produced. Um, some examples of that. So for example, inhibiting at the translational level, um, there are, for example, RNA chaperones like HFQ, which bind mRNA transcripts and prevent them from being translated by the ribosome. Um, we can also have lots of specific action on proteins, for example, through post-translational uh, modifications of the protein to change its activity. There could also be binding interactions that alter the activity of the protein. Our small molecule also could be directly binding one of the biosynthetic enzymes and inhibiting them. So we wanted to investigate those ideas further. Um, but to do so, we first wanted to step back and um, use a more quantitative assay. So the UV vis as assay was basically looking at the UV vis absorbance of the mixture of everything in the cell free supernatant. So instead, we turned to using an HPLC separation. So now using chromatography, we can separate out the phenazines that we're interested in, particularly pyocyanin and PCA, and then we're able to more accurately quantitate both of those levels. Um, and this assay was developed by Jackie, um, Dominic, and Ichi. So what we found is, as expected, um, pyocyanin levels upon treatment with compound one drop dramatically. But we're also seeing the same thing for PCA levels, which we were not able to quantitate based on the uv assay before. So now we see that we also see a big drop in PCA um, concentrations after treatment with our small molecule. So this is interesting. That suggests that our regulation or inhibition must be happening upstream of PCA, so before phenazine one carboxylic acid is um, made. So PCA is made from charismate from the shikimic acid pathway. Um, and then Fez A through Fez G are the biosynthetic enzymes that convert charismate to PCA. Pseudosomonas aeruginosa not only has one set, but two set of those biosynthetic enzymes. So they're located on two different operons. I'm going to call the Fez A1 through Fez G1, Fez1 and the Fez A2 through Fez G2, Fez2. So they're located on um, different parts of the genome. So these um, two operons are 98% identical at the DNA level. So they're highly similar, similar but not completely identical. Um, so we wanted to be rigorous and look at the enzymes produced by both operons um, to see if either were inhibited. So, uh, Anthony Rush, who is a postdoc in the Fischbach lab, first at UCSF and then at Stanford while we were working on this project. And then later Lucero and Kareem worked on cloning um, these operons into a vector so that we could move it into E. coli and remove the biosynthetic enzymes from the regulatory network, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and just look at them directly um, to look at direct inhibition in E. coli. So these are pretty big pieces of DNA. This is about 6.5 kilobases. Um, however, the clone selection was pretty nice in this case because we are looking at a operon that makes a colored metabolite. So we were able to grow up colonies. And if you see on the left, um, these that lemony yellow color is from the PCA. Um, so versus just the background called more dull color of the LB. So we knew which clones were likely to have um, been effectively transformed and had our Fez operon so we could double check by uh, sequencing. So with those in hand, um, Dominic ran the HPLC assays again. And what we found now is that we saw no difference so we saw no reduction in PCA levels upon treatment with our inhibitor, whether looking at um, FES1 or FES2. So um, from that, we concluded that FES A through FES G are not directly inhibited by our small molecules. So they're interacting with something else in the regulatory framework um, that's still leading to a reduction in PCA levels 
in Pseudomonas ruginosa. So these two operons have different regulation under different conditions. So depending on the conditions, the phenazines that are produced may be primarily from Fez2 or Fez1. So we also wanted to look at them both directly in Pseudomonas to see whether our inhibitor was affecting one over the other. So um, the Dietrich lab at Columbia was nice enough to send us um, some mutants. So Fez1 mutant only has Fez2 to make phenazines. And we can see that PCA levels um, are pretty similar to wild type in the untreated negative control or the negative control treated with DMSO. However, treatment with our inhibitor drops those levels dramatically. Again, thiocyanin is um, reduced dramatically upon treatment with inhibitor one. Um, this, these high levels of phenazines in this mutant were expected because the Dietrich lab showed that planktonic, uh, under planktonic conditions, which is what we're looking at, Fez2 is the primary source of phenazines. When we look at the Fez2 mutant, uh, we see that there aren't very many uh, phenazines produced under these conditions by Fez1. Um, indeed, it seems that all the PCA um, is moved to pyocyanin. Uh, we couldn't detect any PCA under these conditions. But the pyocyanin that is produced is also reduced by treatment with our inhibitor. So whatever the molecular target is, it seems to be inhibiting both Fez1 and Fez2, or at least um, the genes that are, the biosynthetic enzymes that are encoded by this um, either pathway are both affected. So next we really wanted to cast a wider net to try to figure out what the molecular target was. So we next turn to a photo affinity strategy. So the idea with this approach is we don't know what our small molecule or our, the target of our small molecule is. So our unknown protein I'm representing is this crescent. And then we can take our small molecule inhibitor and modify it by adding a photo affinity label. For example, a diazerine. So the idea is that our photo affinity label modified analog still binds our protein target and solution like normal. And we can test for this. So we can treat our cells with our photo affinity labeled analog and look for that phenotype that we're having no pyocyanin production. But the special thing about this analog is that we can activate it with light. So treating it with 365 nanometer light will decompose this diazerine, losing nitrogen gas and leaving us with a re reactive carbene. So this carbene is going to react with whatever is nearby to make a co covalent bond. So if we think about the context of a protein small molecule interaction, what's nearby is the protein, so the amino acids of the protein. So for example, I'm showing a covalent bond with a glycine side chain. So then once we have a covalent bond between our small molecule and our protein, we can fish this out and identify it by mass spec. So here we're going to lyse the cell, digest all of the proteins into smaller pieces, separate those on a gel, then cut out pieces of the gel to look at and sequence by mass spec, mass spec, looking for peptides that have our small molecule intact. We can then map those peptides onto the proteome of Pseudomonas uh, to be able to uh, figure out which candidate um, target proteins we have. So to do this, we first had to design a photo affinity labeled analog that was still active. So in our JMedChem paper, we had looked at a lot of analogs of compound one, and we knew that we could switch out the oxygen for our carbon and, and the halides on that second aryl ring with minimal effect. So dropping from 99% efficacy to 96% efficacy at shutting off pyocyanin production. Um, this linker region between the two aryl groups in general seemed to be pretty flexible. So that's what we decided to install a ketone um, which is a precursor of the diazerine group. And again, we took a hit in activity, but it was still relatively active. We're at 89% efficacy now. So Xenon decided to install the diazerine at this position um, and did so through a multi-step synthetic sequence, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'm happy to if anyone has questions about it. Um, 
And again, we taught, took a little bit of hit in the efficacy, but we're still at 83% effective, which we thought was sufficient for our study. So then Zenon and our collaborator, David Perlman in the Proteomics Institute at Princeton uh, ran the results and uh, did the proteomics study that I described earlier. And we got a number of hits. So we got five uh, high quality hits from this assay. So PA 14, 18, 350, 308, 20, 58, 9, 10, uh, 37, 40, and 68, 550. With, so proteins of a variety of functions. Um, the sequences that we identified are listed here. So if we were able to identify the amino acid that was actually covalently modified by the small molecule, that's the lowercase level letter. So glycine in the case of PA14, 18350, or RA, and alanine in the case of PA14, 308, Finally, the peptide spectrum matches are the number of times we saw that peptide um, in the proteomics experiment. So for RNA, it was 58 times, and the rest were uh, fewer times. It's still, I um, saw them quite a few times. So the next step was to check to see if any of these potential targets was the true target that our small molecule was binding to reduce thiocyanin levels. So the experiment that we decided to do to check that was to look at transposon mutants of each of these potential targets. So if we have a strain of bacteria that's lacking the small molecule target that normally would bind to reduce pyocyanin levels, now it shouldn't matter whether the treatment is there or not, pyocyanin levels should stay the same. So when Min, Rebecca, Lucero, and Kendra worked on this, unfortunately, that's not what we saw. So here's the wild type results. Um, again, this is the UV vis assay. So absorbing strongly at 695 where pyocyanin is, um, with, when treated with a negative control, we treat with inhibitor one, we see a big drop in production of pyocyanin. And basically all of the mutants show that same pattern. So unfortunately, it doesn't seem that any of these um, targets are leading to that pyocyanin activity. So what we're working on now to try to figure that out is a second generation approach. So one of the reasons we think our first generation approach may not have been successful is that we were looking to identify our small molecule peptide um, adduct in the background of all of the peptides in Pseudomonas. So all of the proteins that have been digested in Pseudomonas. So this is a huge number of peptides. So our signal to noise is not very good. And if we had a low abundance protein that's very important, but there's not much of it, it's unlikely that we would have been able to identify it with this approach. So instead, what we're doing the second generation approach is we're adding an enrichment step. We are going to purify our peptides of interest that are connected to our small molecule. Um, and that's going to be enabled by the incorporation of an alkyne group. So this terminal alkyne, it's called a bioorthogonal group because it doesn't react under normal cellular conditions. However, it reacts very selectively and very well with azides. So we can have biotin that has an azide modification. And after we basically get to this scenario where we have our labeled peptides, we can now purify these out by reacting our alkyne with the biotin labeled azid, make a triazole. So now biotin binds very selectively to strepavidin very strongly so we can pour our mixture on a strepavidin column. Anything that has biotin, so basically all of our small molecule peptide addicts will be retained on the column. We can rinse everything else out through and then release our um, peptide targets that we're interested in. So that's what we're working on now. Um, the incorporation of a different functional group is another challenge to make sure that we still have um, biological activity and also that this is synthetically tractable. Um, so lots of folks have worked on this in the lab and uh, Kareem is uh, the student who's currently working on this effort. However, our initial photo affinity experiment wasn't a total failure. Looking back at our list of compounds, we realized that our top two hits were both related to colistin resistance. So colistin is in the polymyxins family of antibiotics. Um, only two of the polymyxins are commercially um, used as um, 
drugs, uh, so colistin and polymyxin B. And these are all, both old drugs um, discovered in the um, golden era of antibiotic development. Um, they were approved in the 1950s. Um, they're natural products. They are isolated from soil bacteria, gram-positive soil bacteria. And actually that's still how they are produced today for um, commercial use is by batch fermentation. So you don't get a single colistin out. Um, you mostly get colistin A and B, which difference, uh, differs at this R group here, whether it's a methyl or a proton. However, it can be up to 30 compounds in this mixture at lower levels um, based on this batch fermentation uh, procedure that um, is used commercially. So these drugs weren't, went out of use uh, many years ago because of their bad side effects. So they have nephrotoxic side effects, so bad effects for your kidneys, as well as they can have neurotoxic effects. However, more recently, they've gone back into use in the clinic for critically ill patients who have are infections with multidrug resistant strains of pseudomonas and other gram negatives because it still works against those pathogens. Unfortunately, like any other antibiotic, we're increasingly seeing um, colistin resistant and polymyxin B resistant strains of um, pseudomonas and other gram negatives. Um, so it would be really useful and very important to be able to extend the life of these antibiotics. So I'm going to point out a few structural features um, that's going to be important for our mechanism of action discussion. Um, colistin and polymyxin B are essentially identical other than there's a D isoleucine in colistin versus a D-phenylalanine and polymyxin B. Other important structural features include this greasy acyl tail, as well as the five diaminobutyric acid residues, which are positively charged at physiological pH. So to look at the mechanism of action, we can zoom in to the outer membrane of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So remember it's a gram negative bacterium, has an inner membrane, a little cell wall, and an outer membrane. And the outer membrane is particularly impermeable. And that's one of the reasons that pseudomonas is so hard to treat, is it's really hard to get a drug inside. Colistin is able to essentially punch its way in. Um, so if you look at the outer leaflet of this outer membrane, it's made up of the lipopolysaccharide. And these lipids are negatively charged. Our antibiotic is positively charged. So there's a strong electrostatic attraction between the two. The antibiotic can then disrupt the outer membrane, insert that greasy tail into the lipid bilayer, make its way inside, bind intracellular targets, and kill the pathogen. What happens in resistant strains of colistin is that they modify their lipids. So rather than being negatively charged, they change the structure so that they're neutral overall. This removes that driving force for association between colistin and the lipids. The drug doesn't get inside, and the cell survives. So if you look at the structure of the lipid, we can see what's happening. So here's the core of the lipopolysaccharide, lipid A, and the source of those negative charges are phosphate groups. The resistance pathway in Pseudomonas aeruginosa that's upregulated leads to the addition of an amino sugar, so 4 deoxy 4 amino l arabinose And now we have a lipid that's neutral overall. This pathway is upregulated by a number of two component systems, so signaling systems and bacteria. Um, PMRAB, as well as a number of others. So PMRB is the response regulator. It detects low levels of the antibiotic and then will phosphorylate its response regulator, PMRA. PMRA can then go on to upregulate the RNB, CAB, TEF operon which encodes the biosynthetic enzymes that are going to add the sugar to lipid A. So in mutants of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, PA01, a different strain than we're using, we're using PA14, researchers notice that um, losing PA14, 308-20, or the analog in a PA01, led to increased susceptibility to colistin. And that's because uh, this protein upregulates PMRA. So if this protein is gone or is inhibited, this part of the signaling pathway is interrupted and the RNB operon can't be upregulated. 
in a, so um, a small molecule that interrupts that should lead to the increased susceptibility to colistin. Also, for mutants that are resistant to colistin, this uh, most mutants have um, mutations in the PMRAB or other two component systems, which leads them to be activated all the time, not just when colistin is present. So we can also look at the R and B operon a little bit more closely. So the enzymes encoded by the R and B operon uh, start with UDP glucuronic acid, and then do a lot of work to activate this sugar for addition onto lipid A. Um, if you remember, our first hit um, from the proteomics list was RNA that we saw 58 times. So RNA is the first committed step of this pathway. The C-terminal domain of RNA promotes a oxidative decarboxylation. And it's a pretty unique enzyme because not only does it promote the first step in the pathway, but the third step. So RNB comes in and installs an amino group. And then the N-terminal domain of RNA formulates that amine before continuing on its way to the addition of lipid A. So all of these steps are really important um, for the modification of the outer membrane. So lack or inhibition of any of them should lead to pseudomonas keeping a negatively charged outer membrane. So those phosphate groups would be there and colistin would continue to work. So next uh, we wanted to test to see if our small molecule was indeed acting as an adjuvant, was it making uh, a lower dose of colistin effective to kill the bacterium. So Lauren did these assays and we're looking at on the left, increasing concentrations of colistin and we're looking at cell viability based on the OD600, so the turbidity of the solution or our cell culture. In black, we can see um, the negative control when we just look at colistin alone. However, when we add 50 micromolar of our inhibitor, in this case, we're using an analog of the photo affinity label. So it's like the photo affinity label analog, except lacking the diazerine, which would be at this position. But a treatment of that inhibitor or the adjuvant moves the curve to the left. So meaning that now a lower dose of colistin is needed to kill the pathogen. So this is important because we mentioned that um, these drugs have some bad side effects. So when our dose, uh, the effective dose of the drug is close to the dose that leads to those bad side effects, we say it has a narrow therapeutic index. If we're able to use now a lower treatment of colistin, we've widened the therapeutic index and are farther away from uh, potentially invoking those bad side effects. So that would be really useful clinically. We can also look at the inhibitor by itself, so increasing um, concentrations of the inhibitor. If we look at it by itself, we can see that there's no effect on growth at 100 micromolar and below. And that's not surprising, that was by design. We had designed this class of uh, small molecules to be antivirulence inhibitors that did not affect growth. However, if we add a sublethal dose of colistin, we can see a nice dose response curve where the half maximal dose, the IC50, is about two micromolar. Based on uh, some of the preliminary work we've done, it looks like this compound is definitely not the most active um, in our repertoire. For example, compound one that we uh, started discussing, if you look at the static minimum inhibitory concentration, that's the dose of colistin where, or the smallest dose of colistin where no bacterial growth is shown. If we use colistin alone, uh, it takes one microgram per mill of colistin, but if we add 50 micromolar of compound one, we've dropped that concentration fourfold. So again, widening that therapeutic index. And the results that I've shown you have all been in susceptible bacteria, but our preliminary results with, um, res with resistant mutants or under resistance inducing conditions um, demonstrate that our drug, drug combination also really works in that case, which is even more exciting. So to summarize, uh, we found that Fez A through Fez G are not likely uh, directly inhibited by our small molecule inhibitor. Um, so we still don't know 
what our post-transcriptional target is for the antithiocyanin activity, but those work, that work is underway um, to hopefully figure that out eventually. But excitingly, we found this really unexpected Clisin adjuvant activity. Um, these drugs are exciting. They're potentially a first-in-class target. Um, no inhibitors of RNA or PA1430820 have been disclosed. Um, in addition, there have been very few uh, small molecules targeting the ORN biosynthetic pathway in general. Um, there've only been one, uh, re there's been a number of reports for ORN-T um, just over the past years that catalyzes the last step, but none of the other enzymes in the pathway have even been reported as being inhibited. I already mentioned this has the potential to widen that therapeutic index, which would be really helpful to avoid the bad side effects that these drugs can have, especially in critically ill patients. And um, we're really excited about the potential uh, of these drugs to work with colistin resistant strains, and not only to look at pseudomonas, but other gram negative bacteria, which also use this modification pathway. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. So now I get to thank all of the folks who uh, worked on this project. Um, as I mentioned, this project started at Princeton, where I worked with uh, Marty Samuelhack and Bonnie Bassler. Um, Zenon was the undergraduate uh, who started the photo affinity project at Princeton. He's currently working on his MD PhD at Harvard and Cambridge. Uh, then a number of folks in my lab have worked on this, especially Dominic Ortega, but also Lauren, Rebecca, let's see here, Jackie, Min, Lucero, Kareem, and Kendra. Excuse me a second. If you know, sorry. Um, a number of these folks are still in my lab, but a uh, number have gone on to do their PhD studies. So Lauren's at Texas A&M, Rebecca's at Vanderbilt, Min is at UCSF, um, Jackie is working at Boehringer at Ingelheim. I'd also like to thank uh, my current lab, or the rest of my current lab, include some of those folks. Uh, our other collaborators, Ichi, who is in the PESIC lab, uh, who helped us with some HPLC refinement on our methods. David Perlman, who is at the proteomics core at Princeton, and Anthony, the postdoc, who uh, helped us with the cloning. I also really appreciate my funding sources who have funded our research and my students. So from NIH to C-Superb, San Jose State, Organic Synthesis, uh, and then for funding my students, NIH, RISE, LSAM, and COSRAD. All right, uh, thank you very much again for watching my talk uh, on this uh, <laughs> first week of class, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, I think you're on mute still. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, fascinating talk. Um, I have to admit my uh, biochemistry is not great, but I have a couple of questions to, to start off with, if that's all right. Um, yeah. The first is that, um, you know, I, I keep hearing more and more that the idea that there is a dose that's uh, correct for a person uh, or correct for a group people um, is not the right formulation, right? And that um, drug dosage should be much more um, personalized. So to what extent um, do you think that adjuvants can play a role in that? Are they, um, you know, are there personalized levels of the adjuvants or is that too detailed a question for the, the status of this research right now? So I, I think that's like a big unknown. We don't know right now what the, um, whether, we don't know a lot of things, right? So when you're worrying about dosage, you're worrying about the side effects as well as the, the positive right. effects that you want. So we haven't done much to investigate the potential side effects on the human host cells. So that's an, a next state future direction. Um, however, I will say for the kind of personalized medicine, especially with these drugs that have a really narrow therapeutic index um, like um, colistin and polymyxin um, in the clinic, best practices are that they're monitoring like um, the liver function to, uh, and kidney function to make sure mm -hmm. that the kidneys aren't being affected. Um, and that the role of the adjuvants in that case might just by widening it, that there's um, fewer concerns. It just gives you more room to play, right? Right, there's more wiggle room that hopefully we're encompassing more people that aren't having side effects by lowering it. So um, not exactly the answer maybe that you're looking for, but that's how I can no, answer I Thanks. Um, and I'm going to ask one more. Um, 
what kinds of, um, for, for someone who's not a, uh, a pro at biosafety, um, tell me about what kinds of precautions you have to have for your lab um, in order to work with the Pseudomonas. Right, so Pseudomonas is a biosafety level two pathogen since it is a human pathogen. Um, so we have to um, be careful. A lot of it is um, standard microbiological techniques to protect yourself as well as to keep your bacteria stable. Um, the big difference with BSL-2 is that we work inside a biological safety cabinet, which has a set of HEPA filters, both for going in to protect the sterility of the environment and also going out to protect you. Um, so anything that has a potential to create splashes. So BSL-2 pathogens aren't airborne, but if you have infectious aerosols, which we all know a lot more about these days than we did a year ago, um, right. those are potential ways to uh, contract the disease. So we have to make sure to minimize those and work in the biosafety cabinet if we're doing procedures that have the potential to create those. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience uh, and I'm gonna let Phil Heller go first because he put his question in about 20 minutes ago. Um, go ahead, Phil. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh -huh. hi, Laura. Um, that was great. And I'm really feeling smug right now because I understood so much of it, which is not bad for a software guy. And um, <laughs> I do want to say the impression I got was that the biochemical systems that you make are as intricate as the software systems that I make, but I just type them in. You know, you got to make them in vitro. So uh, props to you on that. My question was, um, are there other quorum sensing bacteria that are also high on the, um, the top 10 list because they're... Um, because they cause diseases. And would your research help uh, uh, counteract those? So yes, um, back to quorum sensing is a really common way to control virulence. Um, so most bacteria do control virulence in that way. Um, as far as, so the actual anti-quorum sensing side of the project, um, that does have potential. If we're looking at a project I didn't talk about when we're trying to actually inhibit quorum sensing in general, the signaling pathway more directly rather than inhibiting one of the virulence factors. So phenazines aren't a very common virulence factor. Um, but if we're looking at inhibiting quorum sensing pathway directly, that in theory could be extended to other systems um, based on it, if we were able to use lessons learned on a particular target and be able to translate that to a different target. Um, but some of these might be fairly um, pathogen specific treatments. Are you still there, Phil? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Did that answer your question? Yep, over and out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, next is Madeline Radlauer. Go ahead, Madeline. Hi, Laura, thank you for this talk. Um, I, this is kind of similar to what Michael asked at the beginning about the colistin adjuvant activity. I was wondering if the chemical interaction of your small molecule with the uh, colistin or with the proteins that uh, um, are its targets um, will affect, you know, if you think that they might affect some of the side effects um, in the sense of not just changing the therapeutic window, but also by changing um, some of the chemical interactions, maybe not have that same nephrotic uh, side effect? So that's a good question. Um, that's something we don't know. Um, I, I would anticipate more of an additive effect maybe than direct interactions of our small molecule with the antibiotic. Um, I, at this point, we don't have any reason to believe that the small molecule listen inter interactions are important or that the small molecule unknown protein target glisten interactions are important. However, if they're both causing issues in the kidney, then, then that additive um, effects of the two treatments um, could be problematic. Gotcha. Is there any example of, uh, like in the past that you've read of, of these additive effects or of, <laughs> Um, the reverse, like a reduced effect because of those types of interactions? Not that I have a good example of off the top of my head. And um, 
yeah, not that I have a good example of off my, the top of my head, but like, I, I think that that's a really interesting question and something uh, to keep an eye on. And I think it'd be worth looking into the mechanism of action or what's known on those side effects to, to maybe start to think about um, how our adjuvants might also contribute to those side effects, which would not be ideal, right? Yeah. Very cool, thank you so much. Okay. All right, uh, next up is uh, Walter Adams, who's now uh, put a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Walter, you should be able to go live now. Super cool talk, Laura, thanks so much. Um, fr from one uh, respiratory pathogen to another, uh, I, uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, I was curious if you have had a chance to think about investigating how those impacts through the monas biofilm formation. Um, and my chemistry is not great, but would you expect consistent results with polymyxin on these data? So, I mean, as you know, biofilms can be a whole different animal. Um, we are definitely excited to move into that direction. So um, that's something that I wrote into my um, renewal for my NIH grant is to look at biofilms next since um, they're very, for pseudomonas and most bacteria, that they're very important in infections. Um, so we, we do want to look at that next. Um, I'm not sure what will happen um, based on what we know about the mechanism of action of our small molecule and the biofilms. I mean, we do know that, um, so I think it could be really interesting for a number of reasons. One, our small molecules are inhibiting those phenazines and the phenazines help. So bacteria that are in the middle of the biofilm are really far from oxygen. Um, and Pseudomonas would really like to um, use oxygen um, as its terminal electron donor to, to breathe or to, in its respiration. Um, but the small molecule, the phenazines, what they can do is they can go out, get oxidized, go back in, get reduced, and basically add a redox loop. So, and when you lose that, um, the morphology of the biofilm changes and it becomes really ridged. So to increase the surface area, so now everyone's closer to oxygen. Um, so I think it's a really, comp potentially a really complex uh, situation because we have the phenazine thing happening we have the antibiotic, we have clistin. We also have our clistin adjuvant target, which appears to be different than the phenazine, than the pyocyanin target. Um, so there are lots of things going on. So I think it'll be really exciting and interesting, but I'm not sure uh, what will happen. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, love to touch on more too on this because I feel like there's just so many potential like questions and like avenues, like combination therapy with different antibiotics. If you could like decrease the doses. Yeah, lots of fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. Uh, let's see, I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat right now. Oh, no, I take it back. Steve Brands with a late arrival. Uh, let's turn Steve's talking on. Go ahead, Steve. Are you there? You should be able to unmute yourself. Sorry. There we I, go. Uh, I should know how to do that on Zoom by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't got Michael missing that. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I said that uh, I'm probably one of the few people who would have preferred to see more of the synthetic chemistry, so maybe some <laughs> other time. Uh, uh, it just seems like, you know, th that's very cool to be able to do the carbene insertion. And so my question really is, could there be some more sensitive detection method like putting a C14 label on that uh, diazerine somewhere and instead of just trying to detect it by mass? So it's a good question. Um, by mass, we actually have a pretty unique signature. Um, in our initial study, we ended up with four fluorines on our small oh, molecule, okay. which yeah. is pretty unique in a biological system. We, you're not going to see that, um, so that helps. So I think our major issue was not um, seeing that signature, which is what the C14 could potentially help with. I think our major issue was that we had such poor signal to noise with all the other peptides of Pseudomonas that we, it had to be really pretty prominent to be able to see it above that noise. No, no I meant for the C14 by uh, 
by sensing the, the radiation, not by uh, you, yeah. you know, using a different detection method. So and I think that could be maybe an uh, interesting combination that you could run the gel, uh, look for the radiation to know which bands to look at. Um, so I, I think that that could uh, definitely help um, to have that a, a secondary um, detection, a secondary kind of detection method like that to, to find what you're looking for. So that's, your, that's a good idea. Thanks. All right. I think we've exhausted the questions unless there's another late arriving one. Seeing none, uh, I would like to thank Laura for a, a really provocative, interesting talk. It looks like the potential of this is enormous. So uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> we hope so. We hope it's yeah, exciting, so. Great. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, Keep your eyes out for upcoming virtual seminars in the coming weeks. In fact, I think we have another one scheduled for next week. Um, for those of you who are gonna join us for virtual happy hour, we'll get that started right at the top of the hour. So in about five minutes. Uh, good to see everyone and uh, hope to see some of you for, for after hours. Thanks a lot, Laura. Thanks.